Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. There are currently eight completed buildings that make up New York City's Billionaire's Row, each more expensive than the previous. But in a city that is becoming increasingly expensive by the year, is this architecture or capitalist ambition? The construction of Billionaire's Row began in 2009 with the construction of 157, a super tall luxury apartment building between 6th and 7th Avenue that was completed in 2014. This was quickly followed by the construction of similar buildings. Alongside the iconic New York City landmarks such as Carnegie Hall, Russian Tea Room, the Plaza Hotel, 432 Park Avenue, 53 West 53, 111 West 57th, 157, 520 Park Avenue, 252 East 57th, 220 Central Park South and Central Park Tower can be found. And these luxury apartment buildings set a new standard for the skyscrapers that make up the picture-perfect skylines of New York City. In fact, these buildings are not only more expensive than the others, but they also are more slender than all the others. The architecture and engineering of these buildings enables developers to maximize space by building up rather than purchasing more land in a city where land is very scarce. In other words, they want to milk that tiny little small plot of land for as much as it possibly can. 157 was the first of this group to finish in 2014 with a 1 to 8 width to height ratio. Then there was 432 Park Avenue, which has a width to height ratio of 1 to 5. And from there, 53 West 53rd Street, 111 West 57th Street, and Central Park Tower all joined the ranks of Manhattan's super slender skyscrapers. Today, 111 West 57th Street is the thinnest of the bunch. The 85-story structure is officially the world's thinnest skyscraper, measuring only 18 meters wide, but rising to 435 meters in height, which corresponds to a width-to-height ratio of 1 to 24. And this is made possible by developers buying air rights, which are typically obtained without going through the usual public or environmental review process. Several buildings on Billionaire's Row are located on Central Park South, which is one of the most expensive residential streets in the world. With an average price of $9.8 million per home, only the richest of the rich can live here, such as Ken Griffin, a hedge fund manager who paid $238 million for an apartment, which became the largest real estate transaction in U.S. history, and it's just for one apartment. However, millions to a billionaire are just a drop in a bucket. Griffin is probably fine spending that much on a city apartment because he has other properties elsewhere, which seems to be a recurring theme in the ultra-rich real estate market. And of course, Ken Griffin is not the only billionaire who does not live in his multi-million dollar apartment. In fact, approximately 44% of the collective condos and apartments in Billionaire's Row are vacant. Sir Hant Brokerage Firm estimates that this equates to 341 of the building's total 772 units. The 772 units have a total value of slightly more than $17 billion, with unsold units accounting for 39.7% of that entire total, which is equivalent to $6.7 billion. However, because the prices of these units are so high, there's no standard for determining how much they should be taxed. Therefore, these units in Billionaire's Row are now taxed at the same rate as the rest of the city's apartment buildings, and some don't even get taxed at all. How does this happen, you might ask? Well, before we get into that, please take a moment and hit the like and subscribe below. It really helps the channel grow and reach other viewers just like yourself. The answer is the 421A Property Tax Exemption Program in New York City. This program was established in the 1970s during a period of economic hardship to encourage developers to build new housing. It has changed in the 1980s to encourage affordable housing, so buildings in Manhattan roughly between 14th and 96th streets, known as the Exclusion Zone, must include 20% affordable housing units in order to qualify for a tax break. However, in other parts of the city, developers are eligible for a 10-15 to 15 year as-of-right tax break for any new market-rate multifamily development. 
As a result, high-end buildings in every corner of the city are receiving significant tax breaks. The rules have evolved significantly over time. It's now known as the Affordable Housing New York program. In essence, developers can have up to 100% of their property taxes waived for a specified number of years if one-fifth of their development is designated as affordable housing. To qualify, the developers of 157 constructed 66 units of affordable housing up in the Bronx, miles away from Billionaire's Row. Now, the 421A tax exemption allows these developers to completely avoid getting taxed. Meanwhile, a $200,000 unit in the Bronx is being taxed around $3,000 per month. But in order to fully comprehend the goal of these developers, we need to talk about liquidity. Liquidity of each asset varies significantly. Every asset exists somewhere on the liquidity spectrum, where in cash, the most liquid asset is at one end of the spectrum and real estate is on the other end. And the goal of finance capitalism is to transform buildings so that they move down the liquidity spectrum and become more and more similar to cash. This makes these units more like an investment vehicle rather than a shelter, the same way foreign companies and their founders frequently use shell companies to purchase luxury real estate in New York in order to keep their money out of the hands of the government. This also means that an apartment may be made unavailable and taken out of the market, but still remain vacant for the majority of the year. And because of the small number of multi-billion dollar entities, both foreign and domestic, there isn't much demand for these luxury apartments to begin with. But what's the implication of the billionaire's row to the socioeconomic status of New York City? Well, first, it transforms housing from a shelter into a lucrative investment strategy, which also gives way to further segregation of class and widens the wealth gap simultaneously. This is exactly why 157 even built the affordable housing units that it was required for them to qualify for the tax breaks, miles from the billionaire's row. It's also exactly the reason why developers were able to come up with poor doors, a separate entrance in a multi-unit housing development for those who live in less expensive apartments just to qualify for the tax breaks. While poor doors are illegal now, there are still a lot of loopholes in the zoning regulations and tax breaks that enables developers to segregate the less fortunate from the top 1%. It also adds up to the city's long running problem of gentrification, as well as homelessness. You see, all governments formed in a capitalist economy are destined to reach the state, whereas the financial gap between the top 1% and the working class will push boundaries on opposite ends. Additionally, most states' tax distribution from property taxes becomes a breeding ground for classism. Richer neighborhoods, for example, tend to have public schools with greater access to various forms of education, whereas less fortunate neighborhoods, which don't have enough property tax to offer to the school district, have significantly more children to educate, and they end up being significantly underfunded. This is the same system that allows the rise of these billionaire units and at the same time fuels the production of slums, homelessness, and housing affordability. That's it for today's video. We'd really love to hear what you think down in the comments below. If you like this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe for more content, and hit the notification bell so that you can be updated whenever we upload new videos. We'll talk next time.